Good afternoon, Dr. JP. The Supreme Court delivered a landmark verdict yesterday, making it mandatory for the parties to declare the criminal candidates or candidates with criminal records out in the public and, and to election commission. Do you welcome this decision? And is this enough for us to reform the system? Kesha, undoubtedly it's a welcome judgment. Any lover of democracy would certainly want information to be available to people, the criminal antecedents and other record available to people, and it will certainly help. But it's not a landmark judgment. It will not bring about a revolution. In India, we indulge in hyperbole everywhere. By this yardstick, we must have had a hundred revolutions by now because of Supreme Court verdicts. But there is no revolution in India. Things simply are not changing enough in our polity. Our political process is somewhat stable and inert. So while I welcome it, I want all of us to understand that it is just one step, helpful. It's not a solution. It's not a panacea. We must look at the reasons behind the problems. It was looks at the moment that generated this pressure in the country in 1998-99 by creating election watch movement and as a part of that, this whole discourse of candidate details. When in Andhra Pradesh at that time in 99 elections, and Lok Sattva did enormous exercise with a very high level team, a former chief justice, several legal luminaries, justices of courts, um, a former secretaries to government of India, police officials of high standing, eminent public men and women. They all sat together, we established certain standards for disclosure of candidate details. And we asked the public to give us feedback, public and media, very confidential feedback. The standards were made public and we verified each statement made by the public in relation to the yardstick and then we checked the, uh, the evidence and came out with the determination of the candidates with criminal record. It sent shockwaves across the country. The reason we did that was not because it's a panacea, but because the criminal politics is a soft underbelly of the system. It's a way of looking at our political system and figuring out what needs to be done to set things right. Because nobody can defend criminalization of politics. No party leader, no prime minister, no chief minister, no MLA MP can say, yes, it's perfectly all right to have criminals in politics. It is self-evident. But once you go into a systematic process, a credible process, an objective process, a verifiable process, then it opens up many avenues for change. That is why we fought for that. As a result, because many sister organizations, they went to courts and in 2003 when the Supreme Court gave a direction, looks at again led a movement, we fought a valiant battle to make the disclosure mandatory, non-disclosure a ground for disqualification, rejection of the nomination and when the government failed to do that, again we went to Supreme Court and Supreme Court gave a final verdict that it's mandatory and non-disclosure will lead to disqualification. That's where we are. And therefore, if Supreme Court now extends the principle and says, let the parties disclose at the time of nomination of candidates themselves, not only the candidate filing a nomination, it's one more step. Good. It also builds pressure on the political parties. Welcome. But we must realize two things. Number one, if merely mechanically we go into so-called criminal record, without understanding the purpose and without understanding what is truly criminal, if you are too technical, then the purpose is lost and people lose faith in the process. Let me give one example. Take Mr. Sarovaram Sudhakar Reddy. He was the General Secretary of CPI. He probably still is, I am not very sure at this point of time. A very prominent leader in CPI. He was an MP some years ago from, from Telangana. And he is an outstanding human being and an outstanding leader. You may disagree with him on policies. I disagree with him on many policies. But as a political leader, he has a spotless record. But because he had some technical offenses pending against him, violation of some prohibitory orders during a people's movement in India, these things are common. With great fanfare, civil society at the national level projected his name as Sudhakar Reddy having a criminal record. Now, the moment you see like things like that and over-publicized without any discrimination and discernment, People lose faith in the process. If Sudhakar is a criminal, everybody can be a criminal. What's wrong? Just to give an example. Therefore, a tool must be used very wisely, very smartly, not mechanically, not foolishly. 
The purpose is otherwise defeated. But the second part is, even if the tool is used well, it's only to generate a discussion as a starting point. If you don't go into the underlying causes and vilify politicians, political process and parties, you have become part of the problem. I'm saying this with great sense of responsibility. Whether it's a citizenry, civil society, media or institutions of state, if we do not go into the underlying causes in a rational manner and look at solutions in a feasible manner, we have become part of the problem. Each of us vilifying the other and undermining the legitimacy of the political process will not lead to a better democracy. It actually will lead to destruction of democracy. I want each of us to understand that and therefore use it as an opportunity to look at why it is increasingly criminalized and how do you set things right. So does this judgment give us a pick up point? And number two, what is, so media I, I think would be now proactive in looking into the criminal records. So is there any exercise of caution that would be important for us to exercise? Because as you pointed out Mr. Sudhakar Reddy's case, so that you know, we know how to differentiate between what's good and what's bad. Vritti, this is one little small little step. Even the whole disclosure issue is a small little step. And I'm saying this as one of the key architects of the whole disclosure movement in India. So just because you have played a role, you must not pretend it's the most important thing in the world. It transforms everything. This is just one more further step. But will it lead to a greater discrimination and a more informed debate on the subject? I hope so. But is there evidence so far it happened? Not much, I must concede, because so far the discourse has been very dramatic. 40% of MLAs, MPs are criminals, 54% of the candidates are criminals. So this kind of a language without a deeper reflection, that's not helping us. That's vilifying the political process. That's not actually improving the political process. I hold no brief for corrupt politicians or, or people who are undermining democracy. But I'm arguing that politics essentially is a noble endeavor. Our duty is not to revile politics, but to improve politics. That spirit is necessary in, in, in the quality of public debate. And there are very few people in the public space in the country who have that degree of wisdom and restraint. Many of us are expressing our frustration and anger, understandable anger and frustration, but in a manner that is not helpful, that's actually hurtful. And uh, as far as discrimination of information, discerning information is concerned, a similar problem arises in respect of disclosure of the wealth candidates assets. Mr. Arun Jaitley, uh, at that time law minister, he told me several times because he was aware of our involvement in disclosure movement at the time, how hard we fought and got it. So he told me, not once but several times, two things. One, about disclosure. He was a very successful lawyer. He also invested smartly and therefore acquired assets legitimately. And acquisition of wealth of assets legitimately is perfectly welcome and actually we should encourage that instead of reviling people because they have money. And because everything is honestly acquired and legitimate, he could disclose that. Without mentioning names, he pointed out to some political colleagues who by common knowledge acquired billions of rupees of ill-gotten fortune, but nothing is legitimate, therefore nothing is disclosed, nothing is declared. When the media sees this disclosure statements and publicizes, the hope that I harbored when disclosure issue came out was that people would see what is the disclosed asset and people who actually have lavish lifestyles and massive assets but undisclosed, why, where are they hidden and how did they acquire those assets? I expected that debate. It never happened. Instead, even today, they then scream, so-and-so has 50 crore assets, so-and-so has 50,000 rupees. As if that is gospel truth, as if acquisition of honest assets is a crime, and concealing dishonest assets is a virtue. So past evidence shows that we are looking for headlines and eyeballs rather than a very discriminating and discerning judgment. My appeal now is the educated intelligentsia. 
the wealth creators, the media, the public opinion makers, the civil society, the courts and the politicians and political parties. We must use the data, apply logic, have an honest and open conversation among ourselves in the country. Because everybody knows everything, wink, wink, we know corruption is there, we know black money is there, we know money is flowing hand, we know 20, 30 crores is spent on elections, even for assembly in some states, parliament almost everywhere, uh, all this is normal, therefore we normalize it. But publicly we pretend as if everything is wonderful, we are glorious. This kind of hypocritical, double-tongued approach is no good. An honest conversation, which is non-judgmental, looking at the causes and consequences, and how do you build a strong system which ensures efficacy, integrity, and competence. Increasingly in our country, honesty is no longer compatible with political survival. How do you, instead of design, indulging in a water power tree, indulging in lame throwing, how do you honestly look at these problems and find answers? I truly believe that our political parties, our leaders, our media, our civil society, they all want a better India. They want answers. And our courts too. We don't want mutual vilification and then one day is 24 hour news cycle and some dramatic statements without any follow up action. We have to look at issues honestly. For instance, there are critical questions we have to raise about the whole process of criminalization. When we launched the movement in 1999, I never believed that this was going to solve the problems. I genuinely hoped and believed that the right questions will be asked and the right answers will be found and they will be implemented. And there are four central questions here. We can go into detail later. The question one is, you and I, from a middle class moralistic sense, talk about criminal, non-criminal. But general public see many criminals, criminals in law, as virtuous citizens and influential citizens and depending on them. Why? Why is a person indulged in criminal activity or unlawful activity worshipped instead of being reviled? Because the legal system has failed in the country. Because there is no hope of getting justice in the formal system in this country. Therefore, if there is civil dispute, it is easier to go to a, uh, somebody who uses rough and ready methods and get a settlement of dispute. If somebody occupied a land illegally, it is easier to go to a bhai and get it vacated rather than go to a court of law and through lawful means acquiring your property back. If somebody borrowed money, this is what happened to a Bombay High Court, um, a Bombay uh, civil judge, uh, a chief metropolitan magistrate in Bombay. Somebody borrowed money from his family, refused to repay. He had to reach out to a bhai, a mafia down in Mumbai, to get help to recover the money. Unfortunately for him, because the mafia don's phone was tapped for legitimate reasons, it was revealed to the public and he had to lose his job and face prosecution. Finally, years later, the courts actually acquitted him because they understood the reality of the country. If a sessions judge rank officer is compelled to indulge in intermediation of some unsavory characters to get justice, what about ordinary people? Therefore, the person who is delivering rough and ready justice is seen as a savior, not as a villain by the people. If you don't improve justice delivery in this country and settlement of disputes and resolution of disputes in a peaceful, effective, speedy and least costly manner, you will continue to depend on these settlement uh, 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 resolvers or for buys or uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. Obviously, extra legal. The second question is, why do they enter politics? After all, the moment they enter politics, Supreme Court is uh, making bombastic statements, you and I are criticizing them, the media is flashing their names and their objects of ridicule or contempt. Why are they risking this? Because in our country, once you acquire political office, you control the legal process. The prosecution and investigation are entirely, entirely driven by partisan politics. It's a shame to call ourselves a country of rule of law. Therefore, politics is a powerful magnet for criminal elements. Because you can get protection from law, the law that should actually go after you, punish you, 
is actually protecting you once you acquire office because it's controlled by you, the policeman and the prosecution. And you can also punish or penalize your opponents and your competitors. So it has a double advantage. It makes perfect sense for the people with, with criminal antecedents to become political players. Now in no major democracy is this true, whether you are president or prime minister or member of parliament or legislature or a minister, doesn't matter who you are, however highly placed you are, irrespective of your political and other stature, if you committed an offence, the rule of law is effective and real and police will go after you, they investigate, they gather evidence, the prosecution will go after you with gusto and you will be penalised. Therefore, there is no incentive to acquire political office if you are a criminal. In fact, the contrary is true. The more, the more uh, uh, high profile you, uh, you have, the greater the risk of incurring the wrath of the prosecution and the police. In India, the exact opposite is true. We don't address that. We pretend that that's not an issue. Then why are the political parties, and the court quite rightly said with anguish, why are the political parties giving them the seats? Because the parties are trapped in a vicious cycle. In our electoral system, the first past post system, in a desperately poor country, with the kind of political culture and the, and the party system we evolved, all that matters is money, freebies and division in society. And the people who are electable, if everything else is equal, who are the ones who likely get elected? The, the ones who get that extra advantage in the first past the post system are the people with massive money, massive organizational power, a hundred, two hundred people who will do whatever you say loyal to you and some caste or religious tag. Every criminal who entered politics, he has acquired a caste or religious tag. When Vikas Dube was killed in police action, in my judgment, in captivity, therefore that's not the best way to deal with criminals. But it is a, he was a notorious criminal. It is seen as an action against Brahmins. When another political functionary of a one per one caste or another, they, they associate themselves with the caste. In Vijayawada in Andhra Pradesh, there was one notorious uh, criminal gang. All castes and groups, they came, they were together and they were harmonious and they were very secular. The moment there was intense political competition in Andhra Pradesh, each caste group in that criminal group broke up into separate group. They found an element in this party or that party. And until now, they are seen as the leaders of that caste group, they have a political tag. You take Mumbai, from Chota Rajan to somebody else, every one of these people, they emerge as leaders of this community or that community. So once a criminal with organizational background, with money, under the caste or religious tag, seen as the leader of that community is there, they become invaluable assets in our electoral process. Can we change the electoral process? going to proportional representation, going to direct election at the state level so that you don't have to depend on local constituency base, another 100 votes by dubious means and somehow acquiring and retaining power. And finally, why are the people voting for criminals? It's unquestionably true that in our country, if everything else is equal, a criminal candidate with criminal antecedents is more likely to win. It's true. I can give you umpteen number of examples. There's empirical evidence. But it's not because people are immoral. Our system is so moribund, so dysfunctional, so rigid, so unresponsive that the bureaucracy simply does not deliver to people the basic necessities which they are entitled to get. If a representative goes through, goes about it in a very honest manner, in a lawful manner, in a polite manner as we all want and expect, there is almost no response. If a representative is violent or there is a threat of violence and is uh, he writes roughshod, then the bureaucracy is more likely to respond. And people want action. They want results. How the results come is secondary. Because most of the people, particularly rural leaders, are despairing, poor. There are very few opportunities. The government doesn't do what is required. Our education is poor, our healthcare is poor, basic services are completely defunct. To get even the smallest thing done, which is your right, is incredibly difficult in India. Therefore, a person with criminal antecedents, a rough and ready way of getting things done, with an organizational back muscle, with a muscle power behind him, he is more likely to get public support. If you don't address these and moralize the issue, merely show it as black and white, 
our democracy will not improve. Each of these requires serious reflection and serious action. How do we ensure justice without intermediation, which is informal? How do we ensure that crime investigation and prosecution are totally insulated from partisan politics and are effective, honest, and at the same time, accountable? How do we ensure that the elections are not determined by caste, money, and freebies, and organizational muscle, but by the character of the persons and the past track record? How do we guarantee that people get what is due to them without resorting to violent and brutal means? Each is a central question of our politics and our governance. Criminalization is merely the soft underbelly of it. It's a symptom of what is deeply wrong. There's a cancer inside. This is merely an ulcer that you see. If you only look at the ulcer and how do I put some, uh, some cream or uh, some other superficial application, it may temporarily act as a bomb. It doesn't really address the fundamental challenges. And that is the challenge. The Supreme Court or the civil society or the polity and the media, we must focus on the central question, the cancer in sight. The ulcer merely is a pointer that there is a cancer in sight. Look at the cancer. No good doctor treats the ulcer without looking at the cancer. Sir, you've been uh, a strong proponent of local governments for a long time. Sir, how does having a strong local government help in bettering our political process and strengthening our democracy? It's a great question. First of all, the more localized the power is, the greater the link between the vote and the consequences the people feel. Therefore, you are much more discriminating in the voting preferences. In a centralized system, everything is a jamboree. You vote for a symbol, you vote for an emotion. You don't look into the antecedents of the candidate or the character of the person or the past record or the outcomes that will be generated locally. The second is, when the candidate is local in a local government, you have much greater understanding of the background. Otherwise, it's merely an allegation somewhere and you are not bothered in a daily struggle. Whereas, if he is a kid, you have seen from childhood, somebody is uh, honorable, is competent and is public spirited. Somebody else is wayward, violent and uh, on occasion brutal. You know the difference. Therefore, whom do you trust? You can make a determination because of a very personal kind of an association. Whereas here is only an assert, some Supreme Court makes an order and then some newspaper carries something. But in reality, for you, it's not a living issue. And third, the behavior of the leaders also is moderated when there is a constant attention because accountability becomes real. Because people in relation to local leaders are not very weak. In relation to centralized leader, to meet an MLA, let alone a minister or a chief minister, to meet even an MLA for most people in most parts of India is a big thing. Even when you meet, there, is, there are so many layers and the moment you try and assert in a responsible way, you are dissuaded by a hundred ways. Whereas at a local and sub-local level, all those layers disappear. There is a direct and immediate accountability. So for all these reasons, not because local governments are moral or local people are virtuous, because the incentives are altered and therefore people figure out what matters best. And when they commit mistakes, they pay the price and the price is paid by them, not by somebody else. And therefore they learn from the mistakes, like a child trying to walk. The child does not walk and run one day. There is not a baby in the world, in the history of mankind, which did not fall and got injured and did not cry. But that didn't matter. Baby learns. Eventually, baby learns to walk faster and run faster than the parents. Democracy also is a bit like that. We did not give ourselves the chance to learn and to improve. And therefore, our populace in a large measure, in a figurative sense, substantially remained babies in democratic sense. And we are very comfortable with that. It's very dangerous. We make, make, must make our people adults through experience, through committing mistakes, through learning from the mistakes. That's why local governments are schools for democracy. So a lot of distortions of democracy could have been overcome if only we internalized local governments in a responsible and accountable way. Fundamentally, and I say this with great deal of humility and a sense of responsibility, not only our political system, but our bureaucracy, our civil society, and society in general has great aversion to decentralization of power. Because of a variety of social and other factors, we don't want to trust a fellow human being in the neighborhood. 
we want to repose everything in a distant human being whom we never encounter whose actions have tremendous consequences and that person never bears the consequences of his actions that's a dangerous recipe in a democracy the stakeholders must be power wielders the power wielders must be stakeholders the consequences of your actions must visit upon you as much as possible on a daily basis then democracy improves not because of morality because of practicality